So, uh, you wanted me to talk on uh, primary prevention of diabetes and lesson, lessons learned. Uh, well, I think uh, it will be really a fantastic, Herculean task to do that in 15 minutes, but I'll try to do what uh, we can do in the next uh, 15 minutes to tell you about the clinical trials and the randomized control trials on primary prevention. And I'll try to probably take talk only about the Indian trials so that we can save time. As you know, there have been major uh, number of uh, primary diabetes prevention trials. The first one was actually the Chinese one. And then came the DPP. Uh, I mean, then came the Finnish trial, for the Aqua Terminator in 2004, 2001. And then came the DPP. So you had two on the white populations and one on the Asian population. And then was the one which we, the first trial on Southeast Asia was the, 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 the trial that we did in India called the IDTP1 or Indian Diabetes Prevention Program. And then we had the SMS trial, there's a DCLIP trial and a Kerala prevention trial. I'll try to touch upon the Indian trials as much as possible. So the agenda would be to talk about the IDPP and the SMS trial. And let's see whether there's any post-trial sustainability of uh, the trial results. And a couple of minutes on concordance of uh, oral glucose tolerance versus HPA1C for detection and for uh, screening people for, uh, for pre-diabetes. Lastly, I talked to you about, I'm going to talk to you about something new, and that's called the inflammatory adipokines in diabetes. And we have done work on inflammatory adipokines in pre-diabetes and how it can predict diabetes, showing that actually diabetes is an inflammatory disease, producing one of the reasons uh, for a causative reason association for complications of diabetes. For those who have not been familiar, this is called the Indian Diabetes Primary Prevention Program, in which we took people with impaired glucose tolerance. Uh, there were about 531 people who were recruited in the study, and they were randomized into four arms of the study. Uh, one is a control group, and then we had the lifestyle modification. Then we had a group on metformin alone, and we had a fourth group, which was a combination of lifestyle modification and metformin. So it's a little different from the DPP trial. And the primary outcome was the development of type 2 diabetes. This was actually done for three years after the, the, it took about one year for recruitment of PP patients or subjects. And uh, it was a three-year follow-up. And that shows you the results of the study, which is showing that uh, the control group, the cumulative incidence of diabetes in three years was 55%. Uh, while it was in lifestyle modification, it was 39.3, in metformin, 40.5. And in the combination of the arm with lifestyle modification and metformin, it was the cumulative incidence was 39.5%. So in other words, conversion to diabetes is significantly reduced, as you can see the p-values here, by lifestyle modification by 28.5%, by metformin, 26.4%. And a combination of these two together, 28.2%. In other words, there was no additional benefit of combining two strategies for primary prevention of diabetes. So the lessons learned from the primary Indian diabetes prevention program was that lifestyle modification, even in moderate nature, will reduce risk of diabetes. The reason why I'm talking about moderate nature is because it is very much moderate compared to the very effective and very, very strict lifestyle modification, which was implemented in the American DPP as well as the Finnish trial. Lifestyle modification works even in subjects without obesity and even without even weight loss. And that is for the first time we are showing in the Indian primary prevention trial. Of course, a combination did not show additional benefit. The other study which I'm going to tell you is called the Indian SMS study in which we use the uh, mobile phone technology in order to change the behavior of people to see whether we can change the behavior of people to prevent diabetes. So what we did was we took about 400 and, and odd people who were screened for impaired glucose tolerance using oral glucose tolerance test, and they were randomized in one is to one ratio into two groups. The control group had a standard care 
in which they were all given education regarding the prevention of diabetes, the importance of diet and exercise. While the intervention group also, after getting the standard advice, also received motivational messages using SMS on their mobile phones on a very regular basis for the next two years. And the, the, um, the SMS messages were already uh, done from a pilot study. It was given two times a week and mostly depend on uh, diet, exercise, and lifestyle modification. That was the uh, technology about this. We were um, uh, happy that we were, uh, we also got a software donated by Texas Instruments. And uh, what we did was uh, the subjects were given the messages and when they were changing their behavior, we will try to change the strategy according to what is called alert change in behavior. It's called trans theoretical model of behavior because in the beginning, you have to make them prepare for the change in behavior. And then there will be pre contemplation, contemplation, action, and then sustain that same behavior for preventing diabetes. Some of them may relapse, and so they have to be recruited back by reinforcing the advice. So it was uh, very heartening to know that. But within two years, there was a 36% relative risk reduction in the development of diabetes or incidence of diabetes in those subjects who received the SMS, showing thereby that by giving SMS messages on the phone, we were able to change the behavior of subjects in order to prevent diabetes. That shows you the uh, absolute risk reduction was 9% because control group had 27% incidence and in intervention, 18%. So the absolute risk reduction was 9%, which is pretty, pretty powerful uh, intervention. So relative risk reduction was 36%. The number needed to treat to prevent one diabetes within the trial period is was 11, which is shows that in this intervention is pretty cost effective. Another study, which is also done in Chennai called the DCLIP study, was a different study where people with impaired glucose tolerance, as, as well as with IFG, were actually randomized into a number of groups and they were uh, given metformin after their lifestyle modification was not powerful. One minute, just take this one. Um, five o'clock, one minute. That's it, the VAP per card. So but the, one of the things about the DCLIP study was that they used lifestyle modification. And then when the, the response was not good, then they were put on metformin. So it was a, what is called stepwise intervention. And in fact, six, 65 to 70% of subjects required metformin as lifestyle modification was not giving the desired response. The other thing about this was they found that if there is a combination of IFG and IGT that was related to risk reduction was 36%. Isolated IGT was 31%. It's a pretty similar thing to the Indian Diabetes Prevention Program. But if they had only isolated IFG, then the risk reduction was only 12%. In other words, people with impaired fasting glucose are more resistant for primary prevention. The next question is, when you do a primary prevention trial for a period of two years or three years, is there a sustained effect? Is there a post-trial effect? One of the studies which has shown very, very excellent post-trial effect has been the Chinese prevention trial, where they found they have actually followed up these patients and um, these subjects up to 23 years. They not only found that there is a sustained effect of the intervention during the six years of trial period, but also found that there was a decrease in cardiovascular events and mortality even after 23 years after the prevention trial was terminated. So we did similar thing whether in Indian patients, when you do a prevention trial, is there a sustained effect of prevention of diabetes after the trial was over? And what we found was that this is 
At the end of two years, there was a 36% relative risk reduction. But then these people, after the trial was terminated, we followed them up for the next three years and total a period of five years. And it is very interesting to see that the effect or the efficacy of the intervention are sustained and the relative risk reduction continued to be 30%, which is not different from 36% statistically. In other words, there was proof that there was a continuous sustained effect of intervention or in the randomized controlled trials. Well, two years of intervention has long-term sustained effects up to five years. We now did another study in which we looked at, because we were also doing HPA1C in the HPA1 during the SMS study. So we wanted to know whether, because the, at this time, the American Diabetic Association was giving a guideline that HPA1C could be used in order to diagnose diabetes as well as pre-diabetes. So we wanted to know there was a concordance whether you use oral glucose tolerance test or HPA1C for detection of pre-diabetes and detection of diabetes as an outcome of the prevention trial. So there are two cohorts. In one, OGTT was used for diagnosis, both for pre-diabetes and diabetes. And the other cohort, HPA1C was used for diagnosis of pre-diabetes and diagnosis development of diabetes. 6 to 6.4, which was the upper part of the upper uh, decide of the HPA1C was used in order to detect diabetes. So what we found was a fantastic. There was no difference in the incidence of diabetes, whether at the end of 12th or the 24th month, whether you use HPA1C or OGTT for screening or detecting pre-diabetes as well as detecting or diagnosing type 2 diabetes as an outcome. As you can see, there was no 15.7 in 12 months with 17.8 in cohort 1 and 2. 2 is the HPA1C and 25.3 versus 27.5. Both are not statistically significant. So there is no difference in the incidence of diabetes and pre-diabetes recruited either by OGT or HPA1C. Well, I'm going to take you into a new territory called the biomarkers in pre-diabetes. Uh, there have been a number of uh, studies on prior markers, but now we have done the Indian patient. One of the first things we looked at was that, you know, that there is usually a talk about association between NASH and diabetes. That is how hepatic tissue or hep liver is involved in the pathogenesis of diabetes. So we did the study, the association of baseline GGT and alanine transmine, uh, transaminase with incident diabetes among men with impaired glucose tolerance. And what did we do was that we found there was almost a two-fold increase in the incidence of diabetes if the GGT was higher, that is, the liver enzymes were higher at baseline. And the model one is what you see is that GGT is adjusted for age, body mass index, family history of diabetes, smoking, drinking, etc. Model 2 is further adjusted for baseline 2 or all glucose tolerance test, HbA1c, triglycerides, even home IR. In other words, it looks like liver enzymes are independently, raised liver enzymes can be another marker for risk of diabetes in people with pre-diabetes. We also did one more thing, and that is we actually combined fasting plasma glucose in order to increase the power of prediction. So what did they do? This confirms that the liver plays a role in the pathophysiology of diabetes. And the next thing is the correction of this metabolic abnormality could prevent the onset of diabetes is another question. We also looked at some other adipokines like adipo, adiponectin, leptin, and interleukin-6. And uh, as you know, adiponectin improves the peripheral insulin sensitivity. So a low adiponectin shows insulin resistance. Interleukin-6 alters insulin signaling in both hepatocytes and adipocytes and impaired energy regulation in the central nervous system. Leptin is related to insulin resistance. So what we did was we found that there was a negative association, significant negative association 
between baseline adiponectin and the incidence of diabetes, a 45% increase in incidence. Interleukin-6, 2.27, again a positive association. A raised interleukin-6 gave a 2.3-fold two, two increase in the risk of diabetes. Again, this is adjusted for other variables. Leptin was not actually associated with incidence of diabetes. When you combine I let, um, these two, two biomarkers, then you give a higher, very much higher one. And that's very important because when you see that a two of them can be combined, you can increase the sensitivity and specificity of predicting or incidence of diabetes. Lastly, I want to give you some of the new biomarkers called bisfatin, bisfatin and pituin A. And uh, let me just explain to you what is bisfatin. Bisfatin and nicotamide is actually a visceral adipokine. Visceral adipose tissue adipokine, and it has got a biological significance related to the cytokines and hyperglycemic state. Fetuin A is actually not exactly from the adipocytes, but is actually from the liver. So it's called a hepatokine. So we can say bisfatin is a visceral adipokine, and fetuin A is a hepatokine. And what we did, we actually looked at the third tiles at the baseline to actually predict the incidence of diabetes in the next two years. And as you can see, in the third tile three of bisfatin, there, has been, there is a 54.2% incidence of diabetes compared to only 13.9% in third tile one. So what you find is that this is a very powerful inflammatory marker for showing the incidence or predicting the incidence of diabetes. The other one is actually what you can see in the baseline, between a which also showed that in the tertile 3, there is almost a 56% incidence of diabetes compared to only 12.5 in tertile 1. In other words, this is another this, uh, biomarker or, or is kind of called a hepatokine, which actually predicts diabetes. Interestingly, when you combine these two together, you can see that if you combine bisfatin and vitamin together, and then you get an odds ratio of 12.6, pretty powerful. So if you have these two biomarkers elevated, then you have a 12-fold increase in the risk of diabetes within two years. And that shows that not only that the role of biomarkers in the pathophysiology of type 2 diabetes, inflammatory marker diabetes, that also shows that diabetes is an inflammatory disease. Another interesting uh, you know, paper we published very recently, as you can see, this was published in 2022. And what did we do was that we actually wanted to see whether we can have non-invasive uh, technique of measuring adipokines. So we looked at salivary adipokines, very interesting. And as you can see here, you can see there is a very good correlation between the levels of adipokines adiponectin, visfactin, apelin, and visfactin in the, uh, in the uh, saliva with that of, uh, with the, and we find that it is in the, both saliva, this is the serum on the top and in the saliva. So it looks as if saliva seems to mirror the elevated adipokines in the serum. So you can actually take saliva and measure it. So what we found, in this cross-sectional analysis, we analyze the association of adiponectin, visfactin, apelin, and vaspin with type 2 diabetes in saliva and in the serum. And what we found was that the, in those who had lower concentration in serum, it was also a lower concentration in the saliva. The good thing is that it is clinically a significant step as it does not need phlebotomy. And salivary adiponectin visfactin measurements may be useful in studies in type 2 diabetes. In fact, it is opening up a new, absolutely new area of research. The highlights of the study to describe to you, which was published very recently, adiponectin, apelin, visfactin, and vaspin were measurable in saliva. Salivary adiponectin was low in type 2 diabetes and mirrored its serum levels. Mm -hmm. It has the advantage of non-invasive sampling EC collection. Mm -hmm. So to finish my talk, prevention or postponement of diabetes is possible. Lifestyle modification and metformin are very useful, even in people who are in India who are thin and lean 
and who are not obese. Well, you can also use mobile technology as a preventive tool in order to change the behavior of people. We also found there is a uh, post-trial effect up to five years. Primary prevention study, all the mobile technologies in India and UK, of course, there's another one which I didn't show you this time, some differences in ethnic differences. Lastly, the pro-inflammatory adipokines, both hepatokines, are elevated even in pre-diabetes, showing not only their role in the pathogenesis of diabetes, but also showing that diabetes is perhaps an inflammatory disorder. That's my uh, team here in the hospital, and I must thank our research team, my clinical team, as well as my collaborators from Finland, uh, United Kingdom, both from London and Cambridge. Thank you.